we're recording. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good evening. Hello on my behalf as well. <laughs> um, so we talked uh, four days ago, something like that. Three days ago, maybe. Yeah, I think it was Thursday. Mm -hmm. Now it's Monday. So um, how did the practice go? <laughs> I remember I when we did called. as much practice as I wished. I only got yeah. six and a half, a seven practice, okay. so around 30 ish now. <laughs> okay, but that's good. You're on track. We want to hit something between 30 and 40, so it's yeah. pretty good. Uh, the talk is tomorrow, right? It's tomorrow evening, yes. Okay, so at this point, um, I would not try to change too many things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I would focus on. Um, making incremental improvement, polishing, things like that. Yeah. Um, you want to you wanna give it a pitch? Do you think that we will have the chance that I give two pitches today? <laughs> because yeah. I think I want to try the first one, which might go over seven minutes, as I just yeah. mentioned to you before we start recording, is that you gave some suggestions and I had some other suggestions. I tried to incorporate them to the talk. Now it's longer again. Yeah. Um, so it might go over seven minutes again. And then you just tell me, hey, you know, just scratch all these new ones. Let's get back to the basic and do the basic one in yeah. seven minutes. Yeah. Do you think that would be a good idea? I think so, yeah. Give, give me both pitches and we, we, will, we can talk about it, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do it now? Yeah. Just setting up my timer so I, or my stopwatch so I can know. I wasn't this easy giving up giving pitches before. It's <laughs> I could That's the stuff. point. <laughs> yeah because you know that the point is obviously and this is true with almost everything um when you learn to do something specific you also learn something more general so you learn to give this pitch but you're also learning how to give pitches in general so that's kind of mm -hmm. it's called like double loop learning or something like that right two birds one stone that's my uh, very basic way of saying it. yeah it's exactly right yeah okay are you ready Yes. Go. <laughs> All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nima Salami, and I am an immigrant. And today, I would like to talk to all the immigrants here, internationals. So if you are not an immigrant, you're probably in the wrong room. I'm just kidding. I'm going to talk to all of us today. It's a common problem that all of us have. But it's good to know that actually right now there are more than 250 million people living outside their origin country. That means around one in every 30 person people, one of them is an immigrant, is an international in a different country. Well, my second question is, sorry, actually it's the first question. So the first question is, how many of you here have ever moved in their lives? They have moved from one city to another city, a country to another country? Yeah, almost all of us. But the second question is, how many of you have ever gone to a new doctor, a new hospital, a general physician? Again, that happens almost to all of us throughout our life. But have you ever thought about how does the transferring of your health data from one point to another point happens? Most of us, we don't think about it. But let's look at one example, which is Netherlands. In Netherlands, they have a system it's a digital system where your data is stored there it's called ehr and your data is also accessible somewhere else but unfortunately such system is not available everywhere not every country has the system and even if they do like in germany or switzerland their system is entirely different and separated from netherlands that means your data is still not accessible if you move out from netherlands for travel or to migrate or anything so that got me questioning, what if the system was available everywhere? You know, this actually arises from a personal experience. When four and a half years ago, me and my parents were actually sitting here in the audience, we moved to Netherlands, none of our health data was with us. It was not possible to transfer. So for my mom, Anna, to get diagnosed with her sicknesses, it took months, actually, and more than a year, just 
for all of her sicknesses to be heard by the doctors and specialist people. One of her sicknesses, asthma, itself took more than three months to be diagnosed again in Netherlands. She was already diagnosed with it. She had medications for it, the sprays. But here, it took months for them to believe her, basically, that she has, di she has asthma and she had to go through new screenings. My mom is not the only person who has asthma. There are more than 300 million people right now who are suffering from asthma. Well, one thing that all these people have uh, are in risk of is asthma attacks. Out of those two, uh, 300 million people, 250,000 of them die per year because of asthma attacks and that they don't have the right medication at the right moment. Well, my mom also suffered from these asthma attacks while she was waiting for the diagnosis. Through these three months of waiting, she suffered from three times of asthma attacks and she was sitting the other moment healthy next to me and the other moment she was coughing her lungs out. And she would go through something so-called as near-death experience and I am very lucky to have her here. And this is something that I don't want to happen to anyone. So to me, as a tech enthusiast, as a computer science student, this is an unacceptable situation. I thought to myself, there should be a solution. And after doing some research, I realized about this EHR system that is available in Netherlands that I just mentioned earlier. But I also saw all of its shortcomings. First, that it is not available outside Netherlands. Secondly, that such infrastructures are very old. They are very outdated. They are unsecure. Such system also is in US, United, uh, United States of America, and in this modern land of technology, last year, 2018, 229 health organizations' databases, they were hacked. That means more than 6.1 million people's health data was leaked, and that could be used for a lot of malicious acts. So I thought to myself, this is unacceptable. This is even getting worse. The more I research, the more it makes me want to do something about it. In, in doing more research, I found out the European Union priorities for the year 2019. And can you imagine what was the top priority in this stream? The top priority was having a universal digital health platform where people's health data is stored there and is accessible by them anywhere. That is exactly my idea. That's exactly what I wanted. But that begs the question, how come this technology, this uh, platform, has not been implemented yet? Why is it not already there? Then I realized, yeah, there are all these shortcomings in current systems. So is there actually a solution to this? And the good news is there is. There is a solution to all these problems. But I want to ask all of you here, can anyone guess what technology I'm talking about? Who is this, that is a solution to such situation? Blockchain, exactly. A blockchain is quite famous nowadays. Maybe you hear it. Uh, you hear it here and there. Maybe it's mostly related to cryptocurrencies, bitcoins. But that is not the only use of blockchain. Even though it is so powerful that it is used for money, that's where people put their money on. But it's actually so powerful that it could store important data in a very secure way. So your health data is important, you could secure it, you could store it somewhere that is secure. That is something that we didn't have 10 years ago. This is a new technology that could open a lot of new doors to our day-to-day -day life today. How many minutes? Uh, 6.50. Oh, okay, shit. So, um, so that I want to bring to life a digital health platform which is secure through blockchain. And the good news is that it is already feasible and possible. And I want to all of you to come and join me if you have a passion for this and let's make a digital health platform a thing of today and not tomorrow. And let's save lives together. Thank you. Well over seven minutes and I rushed the last few seconds. That is the worst thing to happen.
Yeah, so you're on 720, but you didn't inter- ask for, you know, what the time was. That took five seconds, I think. But yes, you're sort of 15 seconds over. I don't think it's so bad. Did you ask about what the policy is on? Yes. So the good news is that they're not like hard boundaries. They're not going to cut me off after seven minutes. They say that it's understandable that some people might get nervous and go well over seven minutes since you're also not professional speakers. Yeah. In that case, um, I wouldn't but they said, yeah, try to stay, stick within seven minutes. Yeah. But then 7.15 seems to me, seems re- really reasonable. Um, so you said you had another version. You want to do that as well? Yeah, but now I forgot it. Um, the <laughs> only difference <laughs> is that the beginning will be a lot more about, as you said last time, a story of, starts with a story of me and my parents, mm-hmm. we are refugees, we are immigrants, mm-hmm. and this kind of things. That was more of the story in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, I will try to tell them. And I understand that you might be worried that this system could also be breached. This system could also be hacked. Okay. But there is research that shows that this is more than 10 times better than the current system. So mm-hmm. we are still doing something better. Something like that. But okay. You want to try? Should I do it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. The story part. Um, I got it all mixed up now. Why did I forget what did I want to say for the story part? Um, do you remember your suggestions? Um, not not exactly, but it was about kind of introducing your 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 family and your mother, and because I noticed you did that you, you, a few things differently this time. You sort of said, "Oh, you know, here's my parents, uh, yeah. mother Anna," and um, that's nice. But I I think it still makes more sense to do it at the beginning because otherwise it's sort of like this. It's, uh, it seems too instrumental. You're just doing it there to introduce her. But if you do it at the beginning, it's like, it's, it's creates an arc for the whole story. Um, so, yes. You know, I, it's, it's, it's like part, part of it is um, show, showing something real, showing some, something authentic about your relationship with your mother. I, I, th- I think, you, you know, part of it is also like you, you're, you're telling some quite kind of personal information about her health. And so you probably want to make sure that you also mention maybe that that you checked with her that it's okay for you to tell that story or something like that. And I did check that, but yes. Yeah, so you you, just, you should say that because it's uh, otherwise you you will probably make people feel uncomfortable when they don't know that you said that you checked that. You know. Ah. Hmm. It, it's the, it's this weird thing. The difference between. Um, uh, Steven Pinker calls it like common knowledge versus um, public knowledge. So, you know, it's it maybe common knowledge, which means that you know it and she knows it. Um, um, but it will be different if it's public knowledge. If everybody knows it, that you checked with her, that, that will change change the, the the conversation completely. It will change people's feelings completely about it. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, I think the more important part is actually making her making her part of the story from the beginning. It, otherwise, it's, it's strange when you pivot to, to tell that story. Um, Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, that, that is exactly the point. Because it, it's great, actually, because you started already doing more of an introduction of yourself this time. You know, you said, hi, I'm Nima. I'm an immigrant to this country. You know, you, you said a few things. And I think that's a, a great part where you can talk about, you know, well, I moved here with my parents. You know, they're sitting here today, you know, supporting me. You know, thanks, mom and dad. And uh, and then you say, you know, just want to take a moment to to thank them. You know, they have supported me to to do everything in my life. And but you know, like you just kind of create a little bit of a yeah. This kind of it's it's kind of like this. Uh, you you're cre- you're creating this this human moment there. You know, in in what is later a, a very technical pitch. You, you're actually humanizing yourself and and your parents which makes it easier, of course, to tell the story about your mother. Um, but it also makes it easier for people to listen to you. So I think you, that part you already did to, to some extent. And it's already very useful when you stand up there and you, you say your name and you say, say kind of a little bit of your story. Uh-huh. It makes a big difference, actually. Um, I also like the fact that you, you kind of made, made a joke out of it. You know, you, you sort of said, well, I'm an immigrant and this talk is for immigrants. So if you're not, you know, time for you to leave now and to just kidding, you know. <laughs> I think that's funny, you know, it's kind of like something that kind of wakes people up as well, especially if you've 
kind of sat there and you've been watching a few different pitches and everyone's kind yes. of the same, or then you, you kind of just shake them and you say, hey, this is only for some of you, so the rest of you get out. And <laughs> that's, that's funny, you know? So it, it'll get people thinking. So. That's good. Yeah. Okay, that's good to hear. So then, uh-huh, okay. So then maybe I don't need to ask the questions. I, I keep the joke maybe, but then start with the, the story part more, like focus on the FSS and yeah. the story part, uh, my mom and everything. Yeah, that's right. I think that's what we talked about as well last time. Is, uh, the questions take a lot of time and um, it's, it's nice, but there's other ways to, to engage the audience, right? Like that joke is a good way, actually. So that, by that point, they're already paying attention. You don't need to ask questions anymore. Okay, okay. That's good. That's good. All right. Should I try it again? Yeah. Start when you're ready. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nima Salami. And I'm here together with my parents today. Wait, uh, can I start again? <laughs> you may start again. <laughs> okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mima Salami, and I am an immigrant. And today, I would like to talk to all the immigrants in this room. So if you are not an immigrant, you're probably in the wrong room. No, I'm just kidding. But Today, I would like to start with the story of my life. Me and my parents, they are refugees. We moved to Netherlands somewhere around four and a half years ago. My parents are actually sitting here down in the audience, and I'm really grateful to have them. They risk their lives for me, literally. But among a lot of other problems we went through, one of them was quite life critical. The story is about my mom. My mom, Anna, she suffers from several sicknesses. And she needs to get checked up with a doctor all the time. So I'm, she's I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to interrupt you because I think you, you have to, um, I would mention it right before you say that, that she suffers from sicknesses. I would say, I'm going to tell you something and um, maybe even like mention that it's like some, something sure. pri private, but uh, I've asked her and... She, she said it's okay um, if I mention it to, you know, all of you, okay. 100 people, as long as you don't tell anybody else. So you can also make a joke out of that, you know? Like. Okay, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but that's like right before, because it's, it's at that moment, I can feel it. When I listen to you, it's that moment when you mention, and then you say, she suffers from several things. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> it makes me like kind of tense. Ah. And if you say right before that, if you make a joke first that releases tension, and also if you say, and she said it's okay if I tell you know my three hundred closest friends as long as you don't tell anybody else, <laughs> that that really will release that tension. Yeah. No, very true, very true. Okay. <laughs> I would like to start with the story of our lives. It's actually about my mom. I ask her permission if I may share this today with you today here in the audience. I mean, on the condition only if you promise you don't tell it to anyone else. The story is about her health problem. She unfortunately suffers from different and several sicknesses. And she has already been diagnosed with those sicknesses in our origin country, and she's been using medications for that. But when we moved to Netherlands, all those health data, all those health records, we're missing. We didn't have them with us when we moved here. And we had to go through the whole process of integrating to the new healthcare system, including explanation of all the sicknesses and getting screened again. And that process could take months. In case of my mom, it took more than a year. One of her sicknesses, which is asthma, itself took more than three months. Well, you might think, Three months is not a big deal, but I have to argue with that because people with asthma could sometimes suffer from asthma attacks. There are today, right now, more than 300 million people around the globe suffering from asthma, and out of which 250,000 of them die per year because they don't have the right medication, which is sometimes a simple spray at the right time. I'm glad my mom is sitting here, very healthy, but she also went through asthma attacks, and I am 
grateful and so lucky to have her here still with us. But she went through near-death experience. She was coughing her lungs out in front of me. And that is a horrible scene to see. And I wish to none of you to be ever witness of such thing. So for me, this was really painful. This was unacceptable. To a guy who is a very tech enthusiast, who is a computer science student, such lack of a digital system where my mom's data could have been there in the first place, the lack of it was really unacceptable to me. So I thought to myself, there should be a solution for this. And I did some research and I found out in a country like Netherlands, you have a system called EHR, Electronics that Passien Dossier, if my pronunciation is good. And through that, people's health data is shared between different organizations, but within a country. So even though Germany has a similar system, Switzerland has a similar system, they're still fragmented. The data cannot be transferred. So still, it's kind of useless if you are an immigrant or if you ever travel. Then I thought, hey, what if we had a universal system? It was accessible everywhere. People had the right of access to their own data. They decide who they can share it with, and they have it with them whenever they want. Actually, I did some more research. I found that European Union Health Commission have three priorities for the health of the citizens. And can you guess what was the number one priority? Yeah, the number one priority was a digital health platform where it's accessible for everyone anywhere they want. That is exactly the idea that I had. But then it begs the question, how come such system has not been implemented yet? What has been hindering them? Then I actually realized after doing more research about such systems, I realized they're actually quite vulnerable. They are very unsecure. That means they are prone to be hacked. As a matter of fact, in United, Na uh, sorry, United States, America, the motherland of technology, 2018, 229 health organizations' data was leaked. That means 6.1 million people's critical life records has been leaked. That could be used for many malicious acts, you could imagine. So then I thought, do we already not have a solution to this? There's this technology I just heard quite recently, a couple of years ago, that could be exactly a solution to this. Can any of you in the audience guess which technology I'm referring to? It is blockchain, exactly. Blockchain is quite a buzzword nowadays. You hear it this place and that place, and it's usually related to cryptocurrencies, mostly bitcoins. So you would think if it is used for Bitcoin, where people put their money in, it must be secure, right? And it is, in fact, very secure. But money and cryptocurrency is not the only use for blockchain. It is way more powerful than that. It's technology that could allow you to store your very important data in a very secure way and have it accessed anywhere that you want. And that is what I exactly want to do. A secure, blockchain-based, digital health platform, electronics that passion dossier for everyone in the world. And it, is, it could be available even today. There's been enough research done, even here in QDEL, that shows the feasibility of it. It is possible to implement it today. And that's why I am here today to ask you to come and join me. If you have any expertise, if you have any passion for this, come and let's make this a thing of today and not tomorrow and let's together save lives. Thank you. That was very good. And that was uh, 5.55, so well within time. 5.55? Uh, yeah. That is great. I mean, uh -huh. I think so. I, I, at least it's, it's well over time. That's, that was one of my concerns. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great. I did start uh, restart the the timer after I interrupted you, and there was a couple of sentences from the beginning that you didn't repeat. So probably you can add twenty seconds, but it's certainly within time. Um, and and I think this this version is is like a lot more powerful than the previous one. So I would, I would definitely stick with that one. Um, that is yeah. great. Um, yeah, yeah, I really like this one. Um, you. Yeah, hmm. what, where can we go with that? I, you know, I think the next steps for you is still to, to spend time um, re rehearsing it. 
mm -hmm. um, that will probably be the most valuable for you. Is there any specific uh, concerns that you have? Um, one of them was, are my jokes appropriate? Are they Which okay? One? Which ones? <laughs> Like the one that is like, hey, if you're not international, maybe you're yeah, in the yeah. wrong room. Is that okay? And I, and I heard yeah. already from you that it is yeah. apparently okay. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 fine. Uh, you you can. You could, I, I don't think that's particularly like, uh, um, not offensive is not even the right word, but even uh, it's it's not that. Um, uh, what's what's the word? It's not irritating or something like that. Even I don't think. Um, so. Yeah, I, telling jokes is, is, is quite difficult. That's something that, that I think you will notice. You will get better also if you repeat the talk. Because mm. um, uh, it's a lot about the timing of the words, how funny it will be. If it's not funny, it doesn't matter. Some people will still get it. But, or, you know, yeah. but, but if you get the timing right, everybody will get it. That's kind of the, the difference on a joke, mm. I think. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's probably worth just, you know, maybe even just practice the, the, the jokes, you know, pick out the, the, the couple of jokes that you have and repeat them, you know, 10, 20 times in a row and just notice like, what's it, what really makes it funny? Like what's, what's the timing and what's the order? Because uh -huh. you know, jokes, like, as I understand it, you know, um, it, it, it's always difficult to, to theorize about jokes, but um, as I understand it, a joke is usually like, the way it works is if I set up something so that you expect me to say something or, or to that we're talking about a specific thing, but then I reveal somehow that uh, I'm going in a different direction with it, or I'm going to, uh, or I have a different conclusion, uh, uh -huh. or I reveal something about the story. I didn't tell you before that changes the whole meaning of the story beforehand. Um, yeah. and the part of your brain that uh, like uh, tries to like make sense of the world, like it's surprised and that surprise turns into laughter. So that's kind of like how jokes work. So that's why the, the order is really important because you first have to set up this tension where you set up an expectation and then you break the expectation and that's what, what, what makes it funny. Okay. Um, so uh, although not all jokes follow that, follow that uh, template, I, I think the, the immigration joke kind of almost doesn't follow that template. You sort of say, well, you know, this joke is, um, is, is for immigrants. I, I suppose like it, it is funny in a sense because you're kind of like reversing like uh, you, you know what, what might be like racism or something like you're kind of saying oh, yeah, if, if there's something that's only for for Dutch people well this is the opposite so so right, call, right. Call every Dutch person get out you know like uh, <laughs> ma ma maybe that's even maybe that's even a way to make it funnier is, is would be to do it like that to say you know this is um um uh, this is really just a talk for immigrants you know so if you're Dutch you know I mean I love you, but uh, just get out. I mean, we don't want you here. <laughs> um, that that way, you're really breaking some 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 kind of expectation um, about about uh, yeah about who 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 is allowed and who is not, and then uh, also about who, what you're doing as a as the as a speaker, you know. And, uh, okay, okay. Um, oh, that yeah. would break a lot of ices, and I hope that I don't even know if if you could make a plural of ice that would break ice <laughs> but uh um I, I really hope that it's not too far because i think it's actually uh -huh. a very on point joke i find it funny yeah, <laughs> yeah. nobody and, will be offensed by that yeah i, I don't think so i mean, I mean if, if and if they are then you know let them be offended that that's funny. <laughs> yeah. um if it's yeah if it's funny you know like um i i think dutch people generally like 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 jokes so i don't, I don't think yes um, yeah yeah um, they are very also very open-minded people very open to jokes and yes yeah, yeah. um yeah but that's something that you might just need to play with just sort of you know f figure out exactly what what's the thing that makes it funny and and yeah sometimes it's difficult to see your for yourself as well uh what, what can be funny i remember um in my first uh ted talk i um i hadn't really planned any jokes into it and uh, then I had a coach, you know, like like you have that guy who works mm -hmm. for the TEDx. We had one guy there, and and I, he was like coaching us the day before, and the day before, you know, he, we're talking, and I'm kind of really stressing out, I'm, you know, really nervous about it, and um, and he has a session with me, you know, 30 minutes an hour or something like that, and then he says, um, you, you should add a, a, a joke to it, you know, break the ice a little bit, and I was like, yeah, but I'm not really funny, you know, like, <laughs> and. Um, He's like, well, what about, um, he, he gives me a joke. He says, what about, um, 
uh, he, he, he kind of, I don't know, I can't remember, it's not, I don't think it's part of the story, but he, at some point I, he, told, he asked me some questions about who I am and I told him, you know, I'm half German and he, he said, well, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of, can you can make a joke about that? And, you know, we, it was in the UK and he said, the UK love to laugh about Germans, so you could, um, um, uh, Britons love, love to laugh about Germans. So he said, um, a stereotype about Germans that we have is that um, they, they, they're not very emotional. So since my talk, talk was about emotional intelligence, he said, why don't you say like, maybe the reason I'm not very emotional intelligent because I'm half German or, or, or maybe, you know, you can say something like, well, I guess being half German explains it, you know? <laughs> and I remember that from your talk actually. <laughs> so that, that was completely from, from him and, and it was like, yeah, it was actually really easy to tell. I didn't have to, and, and it was surprisingly effective. Like I remember I said it and then people started laughing. I was like, okay. And I felt, you know, more comfortable and they felt more comfortable. Yeah, so it was, yeah, yeah. It was really yeah. nice. Yeah. That is a good point. I think I think it helps a lot. I mean, it, it removes the tension both from the speaker and the audience, mm -hmm. and it kind of clears their mind to hear something entirely new. Like yeah. otherwise, it's like so repetitive when you hear several talks right after each other. Exactly. I, th I think your your main job as a speaker is to create, entertain. Oh, yeah. Well, that, but also <laughs> create and release tension. You know, like if you if you can create and release tension then people will always pay attention to you. Mm. Um, so uh, yes, releasing tension at the beginning is great because you get their attention, but then you build it up again with your story and then you release it again, right? So yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is how to think about effective like engagement. Uh, very on point, very on point, yeah. You break up and you, you build up attention again and you say, hey, there's a solution. Now, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, now that I've said that, it makes me think a little bit about something because you you haven't you haven't connected the solution as much to your mother's story, so you might actually mm -hmm. say, make that more explicit. You might say towards the end, and if we had such a system, then you know my mother would have been saved some really scary situations, you know something like that. So th then you're directly releasing that tension of that story. Mm, okay, yeah. Also, you kind of make the circle of connecting the beginning and the end. They might remember it better. Yeah. You want to try it again, the whole thing? That way we can... Sounds good, make yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nima Salami, and I am an immigrant. And today, I would like to talk about something very serious with only the immigrants in the room. So if you are Dutch, I unfortunately have to ask you to leave the room kindly. No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm going to talk about something that all of us have in common. But please bear with me because I'm going to start with a story of my life, of actually of my life and my parents. Beloved parents are sitting down there and I'm so grateful to have them. As I told you, we are immigrants. We moved here around four and a half years ago. And when we entered here, we had to get integrated to a lot of new things, including the new healthcare system. I'm going to talk about the problem of us integrating to this new system, especially about the case of my mom. But before that, I would like to let you know that I have already asked for permission to share this private information with you, the audience, but only on the condition that you don't tell it to anyone else. My mom, she suffers from so, was, it, was it too bad? No, no, it's, I, I like it. It's just that um, it's not the, the, the joke part of it, of the, of the, as long as you don't tell anyone else, is, is, is I, I think, pretty much lost. I think 90% of people won't get it. Um, okay. and, they'll, and they'll think you're serious. They'll be like, oh, yeah, okay, I won't tell anyone else. <laughs> um, so, so, so you have to add something else that makes it clear that that's kind of absurd because now you're telling already so many people that it's absurd to think that. <laughs> It doesn't matter that they tell somebody else. Okay. Okay. That's why so, something like um, she said that it's okay if I tell it to my 300 closest friends as long as they don't tell anybody else. You know, because then, <laughs> like 300 closest friends, then it, it makes it absurd. Okay, okay. Uh, how far are we? How far are we? The timing? Did you uh, one minute, one minute twenty. Yeah, I think it's it's fine on time. Okay, okay good. I, I I would say let's start again from the beginning. Then you'll get into the flow of it uh, as as, sure. it, as it goes. Sounds great. Ready? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
My name is Nima Salami, and I am an immigrant. And today, I would like to talk to all the immigrants here about something very serious. So unfortunately, if you're a Dutch person, I would like to ask you kindly to leave the room. No, 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 I'm kidding. I'm going to talk to all of us. It's something that all of us have in common. But before that, I would like to start with a personal story, the story of my life and my parents. who are actually sitting here in the audience, and I am so grateful to have them. As I told you, we are immigrants, and we moved here around four and a half years ago. And when we entered, we had to get integrated to the new society and new systems, such as the health system. But I would like to talk about the story of my mom in specific. But before that, I asked for permission, and she said, I can only share this story with my 300 closest friends, as long as they don't tell anyone. <laughs> my mom, she suffers from several health problems, and among them, one of her sicknesses is asthma. And for her, to get diagnosed with her asthma again in Netherlands, that took more than three months. And for all of her sicknesses to get diagnosed again, that took more than a year. Well, you might say maybe it is not a big deal, right? But if it's something that needs to require, uh, it requires immediate attention, then that's a different story. And that something that happens, such as asthma attacks. My mom suffers from asthma, and she's not alone. There are more than 300 million people living in the world right now that are suffering from asthma. And out of which 250,000 of them die per year because of asthma attacks. And I am very lucky to have her here. But I can't forget the moment that she was sitting next to me, very healthy, and the other moment she was coughing her lungs out. And she went through something called as near-death experience. She is healthy and sitting here today because she has the medication. But she didn't have it back then while she was waiting to be diagnosed. This long process heals thousands of people per year. And that is something that I can't accept. A lack of technology healing people? We are living in 2019. We should have a solution to this already. You know, to me, as a tech enthusiast, as a computer science student, I can't accept this. I have to find a solution. And that's where my journey started. Searching for a solution to this, I actually found out in Netherlands, there is a system called EHR, Electronische Passion Dossier, if my pronunciation is good. And in that system, which is a digital health platform, your health data is stored there and can be accessed uh, in a different health organization or by a different doctor. But that is only nationwide. That means it's only local in Netherlands. And even Germany or Switzerland who have a similar system, they cannot access the data. There is no sharing of the data. The, the fragment is there. So even if you are a Dutch person, you travel, or you ever migrate outside of Netherlands, your health data is still not accessible outside here. That is one of the problems of current systems. The second, in my opinion, even more important, is that these systems are usually very outdated. They are very old. And that makes them vulnerable to hacking. You know, in 2018, in the United States, the motherland of technology, 229 health organizations' data bases, databases were hacked. And 6.1 million people's critical, important life and health information was leaked. And you could imagine how many malicious things you could do with all those data. That is something we do not want in 2019. So in, so in my pursuit of finding a solution to this, I actually found a working solution. Well, before I name it, can any of you here in the audience make a rough guess of what it is? Yes, blockchain. Blockchain 
is a quite a buzzword nowadays. You might hear it in the news, mostly related to cryptocurrencies, which are digital money. So you know that if a system is being used to transfer and usage of money, it must be secure. It must be way secure than a lot of other things. That's where people put their money. So the good news is blockchain is not only used for money. It's a powerful tool that could allow the storage of data, your health data, for example, in a very secure way. And also, it makes your data accessible everywhere. That means you have the right and ownership of your own health data, and you could decide who you want to share it to. You don't want your data to be just anywhere. You decide, I want to share it today with this doctor, and for this period of time. And then again, it's yours. That's the power of blockchain. Then I was worried, how about the legislation? It becomes with such a solution. Will it be ever implemented because of political problems maybe? But well, there is a good news. European Union Health Commission have come up with three priorities for the health of the citizens. And out of those three, do you know what is the top priority? Good news, the top priority is a digital health platform that is secure and it's accessible by all the people everywhere. And this is what we're going to implement. This is something that has been, uh, research has been done around here in TU Delft. This is something we could do today. And with that, I would like to invite all of you to come and join us. And let's make such secure health platform a thing of today and not tomorrow. And let's save the people's lives together and people like my mom who might be suffering from, ah, I forgot the ending. I forgot I had to add my mom's story in the ending. That's fine. But it was, like that. <laughs> yeah, it was, was good. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's not a catastrophe if you miss it. You know, if you just send, end with that today, not tomorrow, I think that's good. So you, if, you, if you get, if you add some things and you forget it, don't worry. I think because you already are, you know, way better than the first time you did it. So you've, you've already that's, made a lot of progress. That's very good to hear. Um, yeah, I think there's not there's not something really obvious uh, that uh, to to fix. Uh, I think it's very good. Um, it's just yeah, more practice. Uh, you you pretty much hit seven minutes exactly, so the, the time I think is good as well. Oh great. Um, yeah. Do you think it is listen worthy? <laughs> yeah, of of course. It's very it's very interesting. Um, uh, I, I actually think what, what might be useful is actually to um, find some people who haven't seen it yet, who haven't heard it yet, um, before you know you pitch it tomorrow evening, and um, get them to hear it for the first time now. You know, at this at this quality level, and then get their feedback on that. You know, what did they did they miss something? Did they not understand something? Get them to ask you questions about that. Mm. Um, and um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Is there someone in your family that you haven't pitched it to yet? All of my family except my parents, <laughs> but yeah. none of them are around, unfortunately. Uh -huh. yeah. um, but I have a lot of classmates, friends here at the university. Yeah. Maybe today I could go to them and ask them to come and listen to me. <laughs> yeah. Just, just be like a little bit skeptical. If you pitch it to a computer science student, they might focus too much on the technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas yeah. the audience will be very broad, right? Tomorrow. So, um, but yeah, it, it, it'll be useful to pitch it to anybody who hasn't heard it before. And if they ask you, you know, a really basic question uh, that seems like something you could answer in the talk, then, you know, you can change that. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, I, I would think that they might even just be like, wow, that's really great. And they would be, be quite, quite surprised um, um, maybe by, by how good it is already. It, it's hard to say, you know, so... Um, how how, pe how people will, will react so that's why i would suggest find find some people and 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 do it with them and um and just see those those first impressions because because i've heard it now also 10 times you know so yeah. it's hard for me to imagine someone it's called the course of knowledge it's hard for me to imagine someone hearing it for the first time mm. so, so that's something um that might be useful yeah um I reverse the order of saying the blockchain and the political part, which is like the EU Commission. I I, I reverse the order. I think it's actually better. I think I it's think better so like too. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so I did it on the spot. Like <laughs> I was like, maybe I should try to say this one first. It's great. And this is exactly why I tell people to do it by speaking because you come up with these kind of ideas really on the spot. And yeah. then afterwards you go, oh, that sounds good. And you can keep it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say, um, you know, it's effort up here. I would say, keep practicing it. If you, if you do it, you know, another 10 times before tomorrow evening, you'll, you'll be, you'll be at elite level and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you, did you figure out anything more about how, uh, how it will be judged or who? So now they have changed a little bit. There are going to be nine people presenting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. out of which three of them will be selected and mm -hmm. they will go to the final yes self presentation competition which is going to be in the, the main auditorium at the, at the telex stuff exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah very cool yeah so i'm very you... excited to be among those three <laughs> yeah yeah i wish you good luck and uh uh cross my fingers for you and uh you. yeah i think it's gonna be great so you, you, you're presenting with nine other people tomorrow and then they're going to pick out of those nine, they're going to pick three. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I think that's pretty, pretty good odds for you. There is a one third chance. <laughs> yeah, well, but you, you've probably practiced your talk way more often than everybody else. Most probably, um, yeah, yeah. I was privileged with that. And really thank you for giving me the advice and being here for me. Yeah, you're welcome. Really yeah. much appreciated. I learned a lot of valuable things in general besides this talk from you. So thank you for being you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah, I hope that, you know, you've learned something that you can apply also in other settings, you know, because it's, that's, I, for me, I think communication is such an important skill that makes everything else um, that you do more powerful. It's a lever, right? Because if you're, um, uh, we've talked a lot also about entrepreneurship before, and if you want to start a business, being able to communicate your ideas clearly to convince you know people to work for you to convince investors to give you money to convince customers to to buy your product like these are such essential skills that mo many entrepreneurs don't don't spend enough time learning mm. so yeah you've made some progress here in the last two weeks that's really good to hear yeah. i actually remember that i had two questions out mm -hmm. of which I forgot one of them just now. <laughs> Very funny. So the first one was that, do you think my hand gestures are okay? My, my body language? Yes. It's, it's I think right it's now. I think that quite unique to me, not, not uniquely, but like I didn't like copy it from someone. It's just something that comes naturally. Yes. From In some which people, case. it's too much. From some people, I, they don't say anything. Uh, so I don't know. Like, do you think it's okay? Yes, I think it's great. And uh, I really, I find it actually really annoying when people give um, feedback about hand gestures to, to, you know, like to someone like you who has actually very natural hand gestures. That's the perfect, that's what you want. You want it to be natural. So when oh. people say, oh, you can do more like this. And it's like, no, it's like, because you, you will get, be self-conscious about it when you do it. And then it will be much worse because of that. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's it's possible that for some people who have kind of maybe maybe they're they're too stiff because they're nervous and they will not move their hands at all, that they can loosen up and you can teach them a little bit about how to use the hand gesture optimally. You will also notice that your hand gestures will probably change. I mean, you mentioned it also. You don't know where you got it from, but you 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 learn hand gestures by watching people, you know. And so mm -hmm. I remember um, there was uh, someone. Who, who I really admired when I was at university. And when he gave talks, he had some very specific hand gestures. Like he would he always like put concepts like, you know, in the space like this. Uh -huh. and, I started, and I started doing that. And I, I find that quite effective. If I see other people do that, you know, they talk about um, the, way, the way things are and the way things should be. And then, you know, whenever they refer to these things, they put their hands here and uh -huh. mentally it allows your mind to connect, but it's not like, it's not gonna completely transform the way that you communicate. It's not such a big thing. Um, yeah. if, if you pick it up along the way, it can be useful, some things like that. But uh, at the end, it has to be natural. And for it to be natural, you have to be doing it a lot. And mainly, like you have to be doing it, doing it feeling like it's a natural thing to do. And so that's the great thing about your hand gestures. I think they're very natural. They're, they're the way we speak um, with kind of you know normal level of hand gestures. I think that's good. Correct. I remember the second question, but I think I will get probably the same kind of answer. 
Well, that uh-huh. was more about the use of my voice and bring it up and down and yep. pausing and everything. Is that also good enough? Yep. Uh, Say so, so answer. I mean, you um, <clears throat> with this one, I think um, you, it's not as natural for you yet. Um, mm-hmm. So there's some uh, there's some uh, aspects of it where you're like, uh, it's, it's kind of it's it's a funny concept. I, I I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, but it's the way I feel when I watch people. It's like you're you're pretending to speak more than you're just speaking. Uh, it's um, and, and you, you might notice that if you if you watch a movie with some really bad actors, um, if the bad actors say something, it just feels like like you you think like what what are they talking like. It's not that the words are wrong, it's just the way they say it is wrong. The way they say it. If you analyze it, you would say, yeah, well, it's the intonation of that word and this word, but actually the bigger picture is that uh, you, it's just not believable that um, they would say that, right? And this is a big problem in, in speaking because what you end up doing is you end up like from memory saying sentences and then it's like, it sounds, it doesn't sound believable in a, in a way, right? Uh, this is not like a huge problem because most people do this when they speak. So most people don't even expect a difference, right? When people, when people listen to speakers, they don't expect actors. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so that's why it's not, it's not, it's in, in movies, it looks awful, but in, in speaking, it's just, it's just like normal. It's the way people do speeches. But I think the goal would be to eventually look like you're an actor giving a, a speech rather than just, you know, an average speaker because they, they would do it much more powerfully and it's interesting I, l- I love to actually watch actors giving you know real life speeches uh-huh. it's, it's way more powerful than than at the average speaker because they, they know something about about you know talking right so right um, there's some interesting like i think um leonardo, Di- leonardo dicaprio has given some speeches at the un yeah um I think that's the only example that comes to the top of my head but if you google that leonardo dicaprio un you'll see him give a very powerful speech i think about climate change and it's um very powerful you know it's a sort of like it's a movie speech you know if you, it's a, there's a movie and then the, the president in the movie gives up and gives a, a speech where everyone is motivated that's the kind of speech that leonardo gave at the un for real you know and, yeah. and of course he can because he's, he's an actor but that's um ultimately that's kind of and and i think the thing to pay attention to is that even though I am 100% certain that he prepared that and scripted it out. And as does, by the way, Obama, when he's giving speeches and you know, anybody famous who gives good talks, it doesn't sound like that. When they speak, and this is something about Obama that's very obvious, when he speaks, he puts so many pauses in his sentences that it sounds like he's thinking about what he's gonna say. Uh, which is crazy because he's he's is prepared like he's not thinking about it you know, like, yeah 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 so 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 why does he give such big pauses it's it's just it, it's of course of course for him it just feels natural i'm not saying that he's like doing that on purpose unconsciously right it feels very natural to him but because he does that when you listen to him it sounds like a natural conversation and so that feeling of sounding natural that's what like you know separates good speeches from great speeches that's that's what uh, i would say okay so, and I think for the average person who's not going to be able to, you know, script out these things uh, like a movie star, right? Because mm-hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio also probably, you know, maybe he has writer friends and he says, hey, can you look at my speech? And nice. they will say, oh yeah, do change that, change this, you know, and they will treat him like an actor saying lines and they'll make the speech like a powerful speech, right? Uh, but since we don't have those resources, the way that we achieve that, I think, is that we just practice it over and over and over and over again. And at some point, you will just naturally hit a point where the, the words are so ingrained and, and uh, that they just flow out naturally. And it doesn't look like you're f- having to pull them from anywhere. Mm. I, I used to do a bit of acting in high school and I, and I know that from, from acting that you have to, when you learn your lines, it's always like that, right? You, the first time you say it, it's like you're reading. The second time you're mm. still reading. Third time it's a reading, reading, reading. It's like, and then but at some point it's, it really takes a lot of time, at least for me, it took a lot of time when I was um, acting to, before the lines would start to sound natural. And it was really the point where I could almost do it in my sleep. You know, like if, if the other actor would give me the cue, because in acting, of course, the great thing is that you're always given cues. So yeah. one of the other actors would say a line and I would, the, the, my line would come out of me. Like I, I was like, I don't know where it comes from. It's like, I, I could be, I could be half asleep and I could still say the line because it's so like, it's, I've practiced it so many times responding to that line with this line that it's hundred percent natural, right? And when it feels like that, then the audience also perceives it like it's natural. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it's like it came out of your being and not just out of your head. You know, that's the, that's the kind of the difference. True, true. 
but yeah, so with, for us as for speeches, it's just repeat, repeat, repeat. When we, you know, if, if you have time to do it, uh, because your speeches, it's six minutes. So if you, if you, if you take an hour, you can do it 10 times. Right. So if you do two, if you take two hours, reserve yourself somewhere in the next 24 hours, reserve yourself two hours. <laughs> And do it many times, and it, it it will already sound like twice as natural. Very true. Totally agreed. Yes, yes. Very good answers. <laughs> very, both politically correct, both like technically very <laughs> useful. <laughs> I never tried to be politically correct, so I'm upset about that. <laughs> what? Say, sorry. What were you saying? I have to also learn from you how to give answers to such questions. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it that's something by the way, where I think, and this is something that it took me a really long time to figure out. Uh, and I, I think I only learned that in the last two years, which is like, uh, I think a question I also have to ask myself is how do you become confident at something? And what I read, I think it was Mark Manson who says that um, confidence follows competence. So if you have expertise in something, when you talk about it, you will sound confident. So the reason I sound confident when I talk about speaking is because I, I, I've done a lot of it. I've thought a lot about it. I've taught a lot of people about it. So for me, it's just like the stuff just comes out. It's right. And so um, I, I sound confident because I'm competent. Right. And that's, um, I, I wasn't, I didn't used to be like that about speaking. You know, that's also a recent thing. I used to be awful at speaking actually. Um, and it's something I had to learn. And, and maybe also because I had to learn it, uh, my competence is very conscious. There's this idea. There's I don't know if you heard about this four levels of mastery. People talk mm -hmm. about uh, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then unconscious competence. Wow. Okay. Like the four levels. So what it means is unconscious incompetence means you don't know what you're bad at. Yeah. Conscious incompetence means you know what you're missing, and the next step is conscious competence. You know how to be good at something, and then the final step is unconscious competence that you no longer I have to think about anything to be good at it, right? And so yeah. with speaking also, I'm not, I don't think I'm mostly at the fourth level, I'm mostly at the third level. And so that's why it's easy for me to talk about because I'm still always thinking about what do I have to do to give it a good talk? For me, it's conscious yeah. competence level. So because it's so conscious for me, it's very easy for me to talk about it. Okay, okay. Interesting, we didn't know that. <laughs> New things I learn every day. Yeah, that's... Um... I like that model because it explains a lot of things. It also explains why some people who might be masters at something might not be very good at explaining how to do it because mm -hmm. they, they've forgotten how to learn it. Okay. They don't have to think about it. Wow. wow. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's leave it there. Um, and yeah, good luck. Crossing my fingers for you. Um, very excited to hear the, to see the video once it comes out. Um, and uh, yeah, keep practicing. Sure. Thank you so much for your time and for all these sessions we had. And I wish you also the best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.